In the SAP 6502 series, I built a 6502 compatible computer based on the SAP architecture, and a number of people have asked for schematics. The first prototype used point-to-point -point wiring, but I know this build technique isn't for everyone. The designs outlined in this series, and I go over the microcode in a second series. The purpose of this series is to go over the schematic diagrams in detail, which are available on GitHub. I've already covered the sequencer, the program counter, and the memory cards, and in this video, I'm designing the ALU and status cards, and I'll test them working all together. The 6502 microprocessor is based on the von Neumann architecture, and at the heart of these machines is the fetch, decode, execute cycle. The 6502 has no halt instruction, it just endlessly loops through these three steps, one at a time. In fetch, we read the current instruction from the main memory using the address stored in the program counter. Next, we decode the instruction, and this often requires us to calculate an effective address for the data. Finally, we execute the instruction, which might be a load or store, an ALU operation, or a jump or branch. Then we start again. In fetch and decode, we may need to increment the program counter, and this occurs within the program counter module itself. But both decode and execute may require some form of arithmetic or logic, which involves the ALU, hence the name, Arithmetic Logic Unit. The 6502 has a number of addressing modes, and those involving the index X or index Y registers require an addition. Meanwhile, the relative addressing mode requires a sign extended addition, all of which are done in the ALU. When we look at the instruction set itself, a number require ALU operations during the execute phase, including AND, OR, exclusive OR, ADD with CARRY, subtract with CARRY, COMPARE, and even LOAD requires the ALU. Some of the less conspicuous instructions also require the ALU, such as increment, decrement, shift left, and shift right. Now it turns out, the 74HC181 ALU chip performs nearly all of these operations with one notable exception which I'll come to in a minute. In some ways, this isn't actually a surprise, given that the 74181 was the basis of the data point 2200. This was a TTL-based CPU, which led to the Intel 8008, then 8080, and Zilog Z80, which was the main competitor to the 6502. It could be argued that this 7400 series chip really is the basis of the ALU in modern computers. The 74HC181 can perform a number of operations, but the main ones we're interested in are AND, OR, Exclusive OR, ADD, and Subtract. We perform a shift left by adding a number to itself, but there's no instruction for shift right, and this was problematic in the early 6502, where there was actually a bug in the shift right logic. If we look carefully at the 6502 architecture, we can see the ALU here in the middle, and it's fed by an A hold register and a B register. These latch the data coming off the main bus and present it to the ALU. The output from the ALU is stored in a hold register, which then communicates via the special bus with a number of registers within the 6502 itself, including the accumulator. The W bus in this architecture is somewhat analogous to the internal data bus and special data bus in the 6502. So, we have two registers feeding off it, the A hold register and B register, which in turn feed the ALU. These are fed directly from the W bus, and they're clocked by a control word from the sequencer. The 74HC181 only operates on four bits at a time, so we need two of them to form an 8-bit ALU. Remember that the lower four bits from A hold need to go to one of the ALU chips, while the upper four bits need to go to another ALU chip. Similarly, four bits from the B register go to one ALU chip, while the other four bits go to the other ALU chip, so that's why there's this unusual crossover in the middle of the schematic. The operands come from the A hold and B register, but the ALU operation to perform the data on is controlled by ALU op, which comes from the main control word from the sequencer. On this card, the ALU op is connected to the pin header signals M0 through M4. Most of the carry signals from the ALU go off this PCB, and there'll be another dedicated unit for decimal adjustment. 
Now, this is where this architecture varies a little bit from the 6502. Instead of storing the output from the ALU directly in a register, we just use a 74HC245 buffer, which lets the output go back into the W bus and into its destination. This may be another register, or even out to main memory. This is our basic architecture for the ALU in this design. It's actually quite straightforward because the 74HC181 is doing most of the work. Now remember that the one operation that the 74HC181 ALU can't do is write shift. To solve this, I've added this extra 74HC245 where the inputs are skewed relative to the outputs by one bit position. So S1 from the ALU goes to W0, S2 goes to W1, all the way through S8, which goes to W7. Now S8 is actually the carry signal from the status register, which we'll come to a bit later. If we look at the flags we need inside the 6502, the main ones related to the ALU are negative, overflow, zero, and carry. We'll look at the decimal flag in isolation later. The 74HC181s generate carry, and the negative flag is just bit seven of the output. Unfortunately, the zero and overflow flags aren't generated automatically by the ALU chips. To generate the zero flag, we have this big tree of OR gates which will detect if the result's zero. If all the inputs are zero, all the intermediate outputs will be zero, and the final output will be zero as well. But, if a single input is one, this will propagate through and the output will be one. Actually, this signal should be called zero bar and not zero because it goes low when a zero is detected. The last piece of logic I'm going to need to put on the ALU card is the circuit for detecting overflow. We compare the sign of A, which is A7, against the sign of B, which is B7, based on whether we're performing an addition or a subtraction. Then we compare A7 with the sign of the result, which is S7. From this, we can figure out whether an overflow has occurred or not. I go over overflow in a lot more detail in the status video in the SAP6502 playlist. Here's the final schematic for the ALU board, and I'll put this up on GitHub as normal. I lay down the chips manually using KiCad. All of these boards are less than the 10cm by 10cm limit, so they're actually quite cheap to get manufactured. I do use PCBWay, who have been very good, and they're not sponsoring this video. I say this because of the quality of their service. I use the free routing software to lay down the tracks, then I usually go back and manually thicken up some of the power signals. This is KiCad's prediction for what the board looked like, and here's the actual board after it's been manufactured and assembled. Now, I did actually make a mistake in the first version of this board. I had the zero detection logic coming off S0 through S7. This misses an output bit in the shift right operation, and this actually caused a problem in Pac-Man. The next board in the series I want to go over is the status board, and this ended up being quite complicated. It's based on the status video in the SAP6502 series, so I'm going to go over it relatively quickly here. But, if you want a more detailed description, it's worth spending time on that video. For some instructions, like break and push P, I need to be able to write the entire status register onto the dummy bus and store it in memory. While for other instructions like RTI and pull P, I need to be able to read the status register from memory and write all the bits into the flags at once via the W bus. I store the status word in 6D type flip flops, so it takes up three 74HC74s. The D inputs for the flip flops come directly from the W bus, and the outputs go through a 74HC245, then back onto the W bus. So this lets me perform those specific 6502 instructions. But why use individual flip-flops? Why not just use an Octal D-type flip-flop like the 74HC374? Well, there are a number of instructions that can individually set and clear these flags, such as set decimal and clear decimal. So I want the ability to individually set and clear the flip-flops independently. Each of the flip-flops in the 74HC74 has a D input, a clock, but they also have a preset bar and clear bar input which can asynchronously set or clear each flip-flop bit independently from all the other flip-flop bits. If we want to clear carry, we assert the clear carry input, which means we drive it low. This 74HC138, 3 to 8 decoder, receives the input from the instruction register bits 5 through 7. 
It's enabled by the flag inst bar signal from the control word, and this allows us to implement these 6502 instructions highlighted in red. But remember that each of the carry, zero, negative, and overflow flags can be set or cleared based on the result of an ALU operation. For ALU operations, we have the four set and four clear signals from the negative, overflow, zero, and carry flags, and we need a way of deciding whether the ALU can update these flags. Ultimately, I use these signals, update VBAR, update CBAR, update NBAR, and update ZBAR, which come directly from the control word. These are active low signals, which means they're high when inactive. I use this bank of all gates to control when the flags can be updated. If update ZBAR is high, then the output of these two gates will be high. These track back to the preset bar and clear bar signals on the Z flag flip flop. When preset bar and clear bar are both high, then nothing happens to the stored information or the output of the Z flag flip flop. All right, we're getting closer. Now, overflow and carry are a bit more complex than zero and negative. For example, carry can come from the ALU from an addition or a subtraction, but it can also come from bit zero or bit seven during a rotation. Even worse, overflow can come from bit six of the operand. So, I'm going to need to store bits zero, six, and seven from the B register, and this register mirrors B for local use. Now, I also need some logic to decide how to update carry and overflow. And that's what this dual 4 to 1 multiplex is for. Based on the control word, it selects how carry and overflow are updated. We have a hidden flag called the page flag, which is used during effective address calculation. This is just a simple latch. By the way, I have a beginner series where I go over latches and flip flops using relay logic. Check it out if you're not completely familiar with flip flops and latches. We have all the status flip flops, but now we need a way to get the status back to the sequencer. In the previous design, I used a 74HC15181H1 multiplexer to select a single bit to feed into an address line of the EPROMs in the sequencer. I'm going to use the same trick here, and this is the 74HC151 I use. Three flags bits in the control word determines which status bit gets sent to the sequencer. Finally, we need to be able to manipulate the carry flag going into the ALU. It can come from the carry flag itself, or it can be forced to be zero or forced to be one. And that's it for the status card. Here it is in full. Again, I've used the KiCad software to place the chips, being careful to stay under the 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cutoff. For experimental boards, it's much simpler if they're cheap to correct. Track routing is done with the free routing software, and this is a prediction of how it'll look. This is the final assembled board. Just to summarize, we have these EEPROM boards which act as a sequencer. We have two 8-bit program counter boards which form a 16-bit program counter. This is the memory board. It contains the main memory in the register bank. Finally, we have the ALU and status card. This is the back side of the board. It looks a bit more complex than it is. For the most part, it's just connecting up the labeled signals on the various cards. Now for the big question, does it work? I haven't installed the decimal card yet, and I haven't tried clocking it at speed yet, but it certainly plays Pac-Man, albeit rather slowly. What it means is that all the schematics available on GitHub are enough to make it work. I still plan on doing a video interface and simplifying this a bit more, but for those that have been itching for a schematic, I have a look at GitHub. That's it for now. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe.